bless you. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you here. <laughs> God bless you. My name is Jay Klein. So, hi, Jay. Yes, I am. So, I first would like to thank the church for the opportunity to share a little bit about my life and my life here and, and my life with the Lord. So, having said that, uh, relevant to my ministry work here via our church, it's been a long time. I recall uh, 20 years ago doing a teaching here called, If You Had One More Hour to Live. And uh, I kind of feel like that right now. <laughs> but um, the ministry God has called me to from here has been uh, into hospitals, retirement centers, uh, firehouses, um, personal homes, marrying people, burying people, counseling people, loving people. But you know what? When I was sitting back here listening to this, the Lord wrapped all this up that I wanted to talk about in, in one area of the Bible. And he said, forgetting those things which are behind you. Because that was exactly what I did here all my life. Two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. I've probably been with many of you folks in all those hours. And that was my life. And, and now that's behind me. And now we move forward with the things of God. 1925. Does anyone remember the year 1925? Probably not. <laughs> well, there, there came a vaccine, maybe you might know. A vaccine occurred in 1925 that changed the entire world. And that was called, what's the P word? Pen, well, actually, it was penicillin in 1925. <laughs> and, and it changed everything for humanity to grow and to strengthen and grow. 1938, polio was a vaccine for polio came out. And, I, re and I, re I remember living through those times of 1938, but when it was still a real threat, where hundreds of thousands of people were affected, dying, what have you. Now we have this thing called COVID-19. It's a real thing. It too shall pass. And it will pass. So deal with what you need to deal with with this right now. When we live in light of this world, we will be most miserable. But here's, here's an understanding. We're going to live through this world that's most miserable. <laughs> How do we choose to live this life? If we live this life in light of this world, attending to all the needs of all the people here on this earth, world, that's okay, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's nice, okay? But when we live in light of our life, our life is in Christ, when we live in light of the world that is coming, oh my goodness, did not Apostle Paul say, for me, for me personally, for me, for me, not for nothing, but for me to die? <laughs> Bring it on. Because he knew without any question, not even a thought of a question, that his next thought was the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived that. He didn't think about it on Sunday morning. He lived that every moment of his life. He knew, was Christ coming? Was Christ coming? Is he going to be coming in tomorrow? He had no idea when. None of us know when. But this is exactly how he lived his life. In light of this great resurrection. We know the body we're going to have will be likened unto the Lord's resurrected body, so we have a lot to look forward to. I mean, I can, I can use some major improvements, so I'm <laughs> excited about that. But until that time, we press on towards the mark. Until that time. But never go anywhere until that Oh, I can walk around. This is kind of cool. Uh, and never um, go anywhere without that being the forefront of every decision you make in your spiritual life. Because this world is going to beat the out of you. So with that knowledge, we're all going to live through the same path, okay? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say I, I saw it, I skipped around it, I considered it. You have to walk through that valley. Every one of us do and every one of us will continue to. But when you walk like the Apostle Paul, how did he endure all that he went through? He only stared at the, at the, the reality that his, his Lord is coming back for him. He knew this. So he became a master in his skill. Masters in their skill. Um, 
I make sure I don't go over, okay? Um, masters in this skill. Olympians. 15 years they practice. One routine this way, one routine this way. 15 years of their life. Six, seven days a week. All of their lives. They practice. For a three-minute presentation. And everyone says, oh, if I could only do that. No, you, you have no idea what it took to, to master that skill. I remember seeing Eli Manning and the uh, New York Giants when they used to practice here uh, in the football. After they won the Super Bowl, they were practicing here in, in football. And I remember going to watch them practice. And Eli Manning would sit with his uh, shorts on, you know, set, hot, go. He would step back three steps, look, look, throw. He did that time and 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 time again. He was a Super Bowl MVP. Set, ready, go. Three steps, throw, throw, throw. He has done that since he was seven years old, since he was in junior league, since he was in mid school, since he was in high school, since he was in college. He has done that same set, ready, go. Back, 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 throw. When a child learns how to tie his shoe. Mommy and daddy teaches the little child. Mommy and daddy <laughs> teaches that little child. And they finally learn how to turn the bow this way and turn the bow this way. And why do they, why do they learn how to tie that shoe? Because they, they, they can do it themselves then. And once they have tied that shoe, could you imagine being that Eli Manning in a college and say, Mom, can you tie my shoe for me? I, I haven't learned how to do that yet. Well, that sounds funny, right? But the reality of it is, is you learn to tie the shoe so you develop a habit. God made our minds so that we could develop habits, so we could do the basic things in life, okay? And we all can do basic things because they're all habitual. We just know how to do them. So we just do the basic things so that we can become more than a conqueror. You don't become more than a conqueror because you have Christ in you. You, be, you have to got to have mastered the basics in life so that you can become Christ-like. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto him, you know, rightly divided in the word of uh, truth. Study to show thyself. Master the skills. These people, the Olympians, these people, you know, the football players, all of those who have expired paid a great price, but they all knew their foundation. They all knew that from that foundation, I can do anything. When, when five men, 500 pounds are on top of Eli Manning, he doesn't have to think about one, two, three, step, look, look, go. He knows it just like this, because it's just part of his being. When Jesus was confronted, thou, you know, thou be the son of God. It is written, thou shalt not. This was Jesus' go-to. Because he had it habitually. He knew exactly the scripture. He knew exactly what his playing ground was. He wasn't an Olympian. He wasn't in football. He happened to be the savior of the world. He tells us, mimic me. Be just like me. What do we need to have in our arsenal as the armament of God? We need one thing. And we need one thing. Well, we need a lot of things, but we need one thing, okay? We need scripture. If we don't have the basic foundation, our basic foundation is knowing scripture. Our gun is spiritual. When we shoot, we shoot love. We shoot compassion. We shoot contentment. We shoot patience. That's a hard one to think. Isn't that like a complete oxymoron, right? Yeah, you shoot love? But this is what the example is in Ephesians. But the understanding is that if you become that Eli Manning, it's going to take years and years of practice. Fortunately, we have the Spirit of God residing inside of us. And because we do, he can help us and guide us and teach us in all things, and that's wonderful. But my, my biggest... What am I going to share in my last hour of teaching here, so to speak? Uh, it's not going to be an hour, Sean. So. <laughs> is, is, is to understand that the only arsenal you have, as many ministers and counselors, songs, scripture readings, Greek, Aramaic, the only thing you have on your side completely all the time 
is the scriptures. The scriptures is, is not important, it's imperative. If you don't have scriptures here, you don't have it. You have to have your guns loaded. And it takes practice. And that's all I really wanted to share on that. But we have to live this world in light of that which is to come. It sounds like such a Christian statement. I don't like to say it. It's just life. It's ex this is life. It's not the way we believe in it. It is life. Now, I, I, I need to say this too. If you don't believe in the Bible, then please, I understand. I don't understand. I don't agree, <laughs> but I, I understand. If, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not a Christian and if you don't believe in the Bible, completely understand why you think we are nuts. <laughs> why would you believe in a God you can't see? I mean, right? I mean, it's, oh. <laughs> but when you believe in a God that you can't see, you have everything. You have everything in this world because it's not that big of a deal anymore. We're my, my wife and I just, I live in a hotel room. I'm presently homeless. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 64 years old. I shouldn't be doing this. I just gave up all of my ministries from borders in New York State, and this it's gone. You know, forgetting those things, and I don't have a clue what I'm doing, but I, I do know one thing. I have great solid, solid counselors that I deal with. I asked Reverend Finnegan. I said, here's what I'm doing. What are your thoughts? What do you think? Am I nuts? He probably would have said, well, most of the time. But, <laughs> but I said, am I, am I, I don't want to, I believe, and it's all Marianne and Bill's fault, by the way. Let's start, <laughs> that's the reality. So um, if they're going to Florida, we're going to go to Florida. But I said, if, if, if I'm doing this because it's cool in Florida, I don't want to go. I, I, I only want to do what I'm doing now. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to retire. I, I want to continue to live for the Lord until I take my last breath. That's all I want to do. I just want to, the Lord, he's, he's compelling us to, to move on in him. But I just, I, I need to, to know, so I asked a number of people who I know and believe in, that will guide me properly. Everything I've ever done in my life, everything I've ever done in my life, I've, um, I've always gone to a man of God or a woman of God and, and took great counsel. And I knew that when I did that and I got the same, well, I'm not sure either, Jay, but sounds good, <laughs> that I could go forward. For the rest of my life, I could go forward. When my wife and I put you know, our hands together 42, three years ago in marriage, and we vowed our vows, and you know, I, I knew I could go forward because God was first. And I didn't get married until the man of God said, oh, why, you're not married yet? And so, uh, so are we getting close, Tom? No, oh, good. I guess um, when I think of our church, I am very blessed. We came from uh, the Way International. Most of us did. <laughs> a lot of us did. And I, I have a, a strong uh, background. Of course, it's always been the scriptures. It is written. Way core words are, it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written for a purpose. To keep us focused on the one thing that gives us strength. And that's the scriptures of God's word. The Holy Spirit, certainly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. We can't forget that. Elections come and go. If we believe in our heart that God is overall, then whoever wins doesn't matter to me at all. I certainly have who I believe I'd like to see. Doesn't quite matter. If our God is sovereign over all, it just doesn't matter. Please don't get a heart attack. I've had them before. <clears throat> don't get a heart attack over something as stupid as the elections. I mean, this is a worldly thing. It's going to happen and go. It's going to go and it's going to come. But the Word of God will live and abide forever. So I'd like to sing you a song. I'd like for you all to sing with me. You all know the song. You can sit there. You can stand. You can do what you like. But I'd like to just leave 
my presentation to how great thou art. I asked for those words also that were up there to be there because it's all about the resurrection. It's all about not living for this world, but living in this world and live in this world with all the gusto you got, every bit of it. So, so you may all sing along with me. Here we go. song, and we do serve an awesome God, do we not? Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Yaconis. I think most of you know me, but hello out there to everybody who is watching online. God bless you. We're glad that you're here. Well, I'd like to, uh, first of all, say thank you to Reverend, to Pastor Sean Finnegan for the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. So if, if you have a Bible with you, you can take it and turn to 1 John chapter 4, please. <clears throat> and Jay, I'm sorry we 
started this move to Florida. <laughs> there are three points that I want all of us to walk away uh, this morning with. The first one is that God loves you and that God loves me. Our Father God uh, pursues a love relationship with each and every one of us that is real, that is personal, and that is everlasting. That's his desire. He wants a family to, to live with for all eternity. And he's called each and every one of us to be a part of that family because he loves us. The second point is that God Almighty will guide us as we accept his invitation and work to develop that love relationship with him and his son. God and his son will direct our steps and invite us to join them in their work. And the third point is, whatever work God and his son Jesus guide us into, they will provide all that we need to accomplish the task that they want done. Where God guides, he provides. Now those are the three points I want everybody to leave here with this morning. And uh, you're headed to John, 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read a couple of other verses of Scripture to you before we get there. So just bear with me. In the Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And Sean told me to start the uh, timer, which I forgot to do. <laughs> so it's started now. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Verse 16, John chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God loves us. He loves us. He wants us to be in his family. And before we get to 1 John chapter 4, I wanted to read a little, about, a little bit about out of 1 John chapter 3. Bear with me while I get there. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called the children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now in 1 John chapter 4, <clears throat> we're going to read that in a moment, but when are we the children of God? Right now, we are God's children. He has called us to be part of his family. He wants us in his family because he loves us. In 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7, we read, Beloved, let us not... Oh, nope, that's not in there. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not... Love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to we also ought to love one another. So God loves us. He loves each and every one of us. And he pursues that real love relationship with us that is real, that is personal, and that will last forever. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3, please. <clears throat> That's the first point, that God loves us. The second point is, that God will guide us. When we decide to accept God's invitation into that love relationship with him, 
and with his son, Jesus Christ, then it's our responsibility to work to develop that relationship, to have the, help that, to strengthen that relationship, and to grow that relationship. We can't just sit back and do nothing and think that God's going to just continue to grow that relationship. We've got to do some things to help it to grow. And, uh, and uh, what we need to do is to daily abide in the vine, like Jesus told us in John chapter 15. We heard about abiding in the vine last weekend. Uh, there were a couple of teachers that mentioned this, that every day we need to be reading the scriptures. Every day we need to be thinking about the scriptures. Every day we need to be praying. Every day we need to be listening to what God is t trying to say to us. Every day we need to be looking. We need to be looking up at our Heavenly Father and at our, our, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. We need, as Jay just shared, we need to be thinking about his return and living our life today as, uh, based upon that return of Christ that's coming in the future. And every day we need to speak. We need to speak this wonderful word, not only, not only to ourselves, but also to others who are hungry to hear. So, uh, one more thing we need to do is we need to trust. And in Proverbs chapter 3, some very familiar verses to everybody. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with 45% of your heart. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight when we trust Yahweh with our whole heart we he will make our paths straight he will guide us he will guide us and he will direct us in his right way because we're not leaning we, because we are leaning on his everlasting arms and not on our own intellect or our own abilities. We need to get to the place where we trust Yahweh with our whole heart and in every category of life and to seek his wise counsel in every situation that we find ourselves. Look at Psalm 40. One book back, Psalm 40. Verse 1, I waited patiently for Yahweh, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in Yahweh. Have you ever tried to walk in thick mud? Uh, it's not easy. I did it once. I ended up losing both my shoes and my socks when that happened. Uh, so it was not easy. It's, all, it's a lot easier. It's much easier to walk on a solid surface. And when we trust and obey Yahweh, he puts our feet on a solid surface. He guides and directs our, directs our steps so that we are always on that solid footing that he provides, no matter what is going on around us. As we abide in the vine, obeying God's commands, and listen, God and his son, Jesus, will guide our steps into joining them in their work. Look at Psalm 37, please. One or two pages back. So that's point two. God is going to guide us. God and his son will guide us. They will direct our steps. They will make our paths straight when we trust in them and when we abide in that vine. So point three, where God guides, he provides. He takes care of us. In Psalm 37, starting in verse one. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in Yahweh and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself 
in Yahweh, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to Yahweh. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Then in verse 23 and 24, we read, The steps of a man are established by Yahweh, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because Yahweh is the one who holds his hand. When we trust God and obey his commandments, he will provide all our need, and he will establish our steps. Even if we stumble or fall, even if we stumble or fall, God is there holding us up by the hand and helps us to get up and continue to walk with him. Now, many of us in here have children. And uh, when our, our children were learning how to walk, uh, us parents were usually right there with them, holding them by the hands, helping them to, to take those baby steps and stuff. And of course, the first time they fell, we said, wow, well, forget you. You can't even walk. What's, the pro what's wrong with you? What's the problem here? No, we didn't do that. We got over to them, we picked them up, and we helped them to walk again. That's the way God works with each of us. When we have a heart for God, even though we stumble and fall, he is right there when we turn back to him to help us to get up and continue walking on the path that he's designed for us. Now, Yahweh, he just doesn't abandon us. He doesn't, does not leave us alone. <clears throat> when we slip up, he is always there to help us when we turn back to him. Look at Philippians chapter 4, please. Yahweh provides where he guides. Oops. Philippians chapter 4. I'm almost there. Okay, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. And my God will supply how many of our needs? All your needs. Again, a very familiar verse of scripture for us. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So, Yahweh guides and Yahweh provides where he guides. He can and he does provide for all of our physical, all of our mental, all of our emotional, all of our financial, and all of our spiritual needs. And he can provide far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think, according to Ephesians 3, chapter 3, verse 20. Yahweh equips us for every good work as we trust in him with our heart, our whole heart, and endeavor to live for him. He's enabled us with his gift of Holy Spirit to be in contact with him, to be listening to what he has to say to us so that we can hear the, the, the direction that he's giving and then we can remember that direction and we can obey. So when he tells us to do something, when God guides us, he is going to provide the necessary energy, the necessary ideas, the actions that we need to take, the words we need to speak, and whatever else is needed to get the job done that Yahweh is directing us to do. Yahweh is our sufficiency, and where he guides, he provides. Now, if, if you're like me, and sometimes you get stuck not knowing what it is that God wants you to do, well, what should I do? Worry about it? Ruminate about it? No, I should ask God what's happening. And in Matthew chapter 7, look over there quick, uh, quickly. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Ask, and it will be withheld from you. No, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. For what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, 
will you will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? If we lack anything, we need to ask, seek, or knock. In the book of James, it tells us that if we lack wisdom, who are we supposed to go to? We ask of God, and he provides liberally. He provides that wisdom in abundance. But our job is to ask, not doubting, just believing that he will provide what we need. <clears throat> now, there are many records in the scriptures that I could go to today to uh, read about men and women who knew that God loved them, who trusted God, who were obe obedient to God's guiding to them. Like we could go and talk about Esther and Mordecai as they were thwarting Haman's plan to kill the Jews. We could read about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and their experience with Nebuchadnezzar and the burning fiery furnace. We could read about Daniel in the lion's den, which Sean shared last weekend with us all. We could read about David and Goliath. We could read about how the nation of Israel was saved many, many times from overwhelming military odds because they were obedient to God and, got, and did what he guided them to do. We could read about Paul and the other apostles, how they were delivered time after time after time when they were trusting in their Heavenly Father. We could read about Jesus and his 40 days in the wilderness and how God guided and directed him and gave him the words to respond to the devil's temptation. Think about your own lives for a moment. Think, think about a time when God guided you and uh, you know, maybe at first that guidance was me, do that. <laughs> uh, but when you obeyed and did what God asked you to do, he provided everything you needed to get that job done. You know, I think about my life and, and Mary Ann's, my life and Mary Ann's life. You know, in 2006, we decided we were going to move up here. And God provided he provided everything we needed. Everything that we had to have was right there, ready, waiting for us. And he provided a wonderful church full of people who loved us and welcomed us with open arms and people that we could then love in return and serve as God directed. In 2015, we decided to sell our home out in Rotterdam and move in here uh, to Latham. And, and that was not an easy decision because we liked that house. It was a nice place to live. Uh, it met all of our needs. It certainly uh, met Marianne's need to entertain and that kind of thing. And uh, not so much my need to entertain, but Marianne's definitely. <laughs> but God provided again. Every step of the way, he provided. He, he provided a wonderful apartment for us to live in. We were close to the church. We could do more here. And it's just been a wonderful five years over there. Then, uh, you know, we didn't know at the time we were moving in closer here. God was preparing us for a, a huge challenge in Mary Ann's life. He had to have uh, several uh, surgeries on her heart. Had a, 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 a valve replaced with a mechanical valve. And uh, also had to go back in the hospital for a... a well, she also had a pacemaker installed, but had to go back in the hospital for a third surgery that uh, really saved her life. It was a serious situation for her. But God provided even in that situation, not that he guided us <laughs> into Marianne having heart trouble, but he certainly provided doctors that, and uh, caregivers that were perfect for us, and he provided all of you to help in Marianne's recovery. And what a great blessing that was to us. Then we get into 2020 and COVID-19 hits the scene and we're told you can't meet in your church anymore. So uh, John Courtright, I think, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who spearheaded all this. We, we ended up with a number of fellowships that met on a, a technical platform called Zoom. And Marianne and I volunteered to run one. And those things have been a great blessing to so many different people. Uh, I, I know we have uh, 
on the, the, the uh, initial one, John ran, he had people from the Philippines and he had Edwin from uh, Saudi Arabia and Edwin and his uh, wife and daughter have joined us a couple of times. We've had people from the Philistines. We have people from California, from Pennsylvania, and from other parts of the country too, not only folks. But, but those things have been a uh, wonderful blessing to God's people. God guided us. We stepped up, and well, all of us stepped up and started those Zoom fellowships to really help folks. So here we are also in 2020, and uh, God is guiding Marianne and I to move to Florida. Uh, so uh, I remember one day, I'm, I'm uh, you know, we've been here now for, for almost 14 years. We're very comfortable here. We have a church that we love. We have a church that loves us. I had a very nice uh, job, still do, until Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> At a, at a uh, local automobile dealership. Uh, you know, we were just very happy and comfortable and stuff, and then all of a sudden, God says, hey, you're moving to Florida. And I'm driving home from work one day, thinking to myself, why am I doing this? This is crazy. You know, I'm giving up all this stuff. And, uh, you know, and we have four grandchildren who live in Schenectady, and you want me to move to Florida? I have a nice job here. You want me to get down there and be unemployed? You know, and I'll, I'll, so uh, I pulled up to a red light and stopped. And it was almost like God was sitting in the seat next to me. And he said, you're going to Florida because I told you to. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I have work for you to do down there. And go and I will take care of you. Well, that settled it in my mind. And Marianne had a similar experience too. Uh, so here we go. Off we go to Florida, not really knowing what awaits us there, but knowing that God loves us and that he is guiding us to move there and that he will provide whatever needs we have when we arrive. So uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, what a God that we serve and in whom we should delight. We can delight that he loves us and that he pursues that love relationship with each and every one of us. We can delight that God Almighty will guide us into the work that he and his son are doing. And we can delight that when we obey and join God and his son in their work, that they will provide everything that we need to finish the job. We can delight that where God guides he provides. Heavenly and gracious Father, you are the awesome God. How we thank you, Father, for your love, for your grace and for your mercy that you have showered upon so many of us, each and every one of us, Father, no matter whether we're sitting here in this room or whether we're watching on our, through our computer screens. God, we just love you. We thank you. We praise you, Father, for all that you do for your people. And I'd ask your help, Father. I ask your help to love you back with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. I ask your help to trust you, Father. Trust you implicitly in every area of our lives. Because we, we, we're just weak, frail human beings, Father. We need your help to do those things. So I pray for that, Father, in the powerful and precious name of your Son, our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to fear, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to throw stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, a time to shun embracing, a time to search, a time to give. A time to keep time, a time to throw away, a time to tear apart, a time to sow, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to war, a time for peace. I picked this, Jay, because of your love for this particular book. There's a time to stay and there's a time to move. And this is that time for our beloved to move.
Jane, Jay and Caller and their family have been here for 35 years. That's a long time. You guys came from Texas, is that right? North Carolina via Texas. Well, you certainly came up in quality over the years. You know. And um, as such, they have been the, part of the original patriarchs to our church. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. We've been through a lot of wars together, uh, wars of, of, uh, of maturing in our understanding of the scriptures. We came from one place and we've gone to a whole lot of other places in understanding of, our, of the scriptures. And Jay and, and Collar and their family was through all of that. It, it sounds so easy to say, but it wasn't so easy to go through. <laughs> and a lot of other things, because a lot of people rejected the insights that we gave, we gained, and a lot of people rejected us, and we had a lot of uh, turbulent times. But Jay and has stood faithful and loyal through all of that to his God and to his Lord. Um, Jay and John and Tom and Chuck and Jim were all ordained together at the same time and have all maintained their faithfulness and service to our church to this very day. Um, Jay has run a home fellowship in his home for decades. <laughs> and uh, he also helped build this church. As a matter of fact, the name of our church is Living Hope, and that was Jay Klein's idea, That's where the name came from. Um, I wanted to call it a mo something, I don't know. <laughs> the original, he was also a part of the original praise team and the coordinator of it here at the church. And he's been doing uh, this, the sound booth in the back for some time now, too. I think of what it says in Romans chapter 12. It talks about the different ministries and different services in the church. And there's one that says the service of mercy with cheerfulness. And uh, that is a, 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 a service of compassion. Jay has been there for so many of us when we've been in the hospital, when we've been sick. He's been there to minister to us. And when we've lost loved ones, he's the one that's been by our side to encourage us to go on. Indeed, a ministry of mercy. And then in addition to that, as he said earlier, he's the chaplain of the fire department, the chaplain at these number of these hospitals. And um, He's been at the old, he's been doing a thing at the nursing home so old, so long now, they think he's one of the <laughs> residents. <laughs> of course, Bill and Marianne and what they've contributed to the church. How do I how do I even express this? Um, having come from, I met uh, really met Bill and Marianne. I've known them for years, but I, I really got to know them when I was in Virginia. And uh, the, I, I remember being in the kitchen of, um, of the leader's home there and I, being told that Bill had just quit his job, retired from a very uh, good job where he was making a lot of money, a very prestigious job, so that he could serve in the, in the ministry with more time devoted to that. And then uh, I also learned about Marianne during that time. And I, I remember our first times together was at the... Uh, the Aphostic uh, prayer seminar that we went to, and that's when I learned, uh, uh, began to learn a little bit about Marianne and her great commitment to God and to service. Both of them, Bill uh, having, having that attitude of service and willing to do whatever is necessary, and Marianne having endured years and years of education so that she could be qualified to serve as a counselor. Uh, she was qualified all along by God, but to be able to do it uh, under legal, uh, the legal restrictions that the government requires and so on. Uh, Bill is our church accountant and has been for, for uh, since he's been here. And you're going to continue to be from afar, correct? And uh, he's also been the coordinator of our prayer team. The prayer requests that come in, he's the one that gets them and sends them back out. 
He's the one that has set up this room for Sunday fellowships for years and years and every other fellowship that we seem to have. Bill is always the one that's involved in, in setting up the room. And um, um, <laughs> of course, Marianne and her, her counseling and uh, her ministry of counseling, it's, I look around the room and so many of us have been touched by her. She has helped so many of us get through very difficult times in her healing and has uh, been so vital in our getting freedom so that we could be less burdened so that we could worship our God more effectively. She has been uh, a teacher. She's run classes and seminars. And um, in addition to that, in between her counseling, in between her counseling, I find her in the closets cleaning the church and, and rearranging stuff. And then uh, at, for our elders fellowships and our other... Oh, I'm going to miss that salmon. I mean, she's been the, uh, she's an incredible cook. There's just nothing the two of them wouldn't do to serve. They love to serve. You know, some people have to be motivated to get involved and to be involved in the church. These three, I've had to do the opposite to calm them down so other people could do some stuff, you know. Um, so thankful for, for their lives. I think of what it says in Matthew chapter 6, and I, I just read that to you quickly. Uh, Matthew 6, the Lord's teaching, right at the center of his teaching, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets, and, and so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. Mimi, would you come up? The... the uh, the, the great, what Mimi and I, uh, the other day, were, were looking in the Christian bookstore for something that we could give to uh, Jay and something that we could give to Bill and Marianne that would be representative of the gratitude and love that we have for them as a church. And it's in, it was just absolutely impossible to find something that would be you know, there would be anything similar to how we feel about them. So we, we were able to get a few things as a memento uh, so that you can, when you put it on your wall, of course, you're, you're both moving, so I know we didn't want to give you a couch or a refrigerator. <laughs> so we got little mementos so that you would, when you look at them, you can remember how much we all love you and how important you are to us, and you will be in our prayers and in our love. And, and also we have cards in there with... Uh, a little financial gift to pay for gas to, on your way down to Florida. Um, would you all come on up so that we can give this to you, please? Um, I, the, the reason I wanted to read the Matthew chapter 6 is uh, none of them have ever done any of their service in the church for the accolades of men. They haven't done it so that you would pat them on the back or you would give them credit. That's not the way they've, they haven't, they have served they have served God. They have done what they have done because of their love and their devotion for God. And their service has been as God has motivated them. And their, their reward has always been from God. And uh, I am I'm very thankful to know that he will reward you all. So God bless you. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rosanne. <laughs> you want to say something? No? You want to say something? You don't have to. I mean, you. No, no. I guess, Go ahead. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm sure you'll see us again. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Well, Bill and I are very thankful for 
all the love and the grace that you've extended to us and allowing us to serve you. And I just want each of you to remember how much God encourages you each and every day just to do what he is asking you to do. And just do it, okay? And uh, we're only a phone call away, so that helps my heart because I want to know that you're still in contact with me. I'm going to have a prayer, and while I do that, would the praise team come up? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for how good you are to us and how loving and kind. I thank you for Jay and Carla and for their children and for your blessing upon their lives. I thank you for Bill and Marianne and for their children and their grandchildren and for your blessing upon all of them. And Father, thank you for giving them to us as a, as a family here, as a people that have needed the services that they could only they could render to us. And Father, I pray that you rise up other people to fill their shoes and other people to, to carry out the, the ministry that, um, that both of all of them that they have represented to us. And Father, I know you're a God of great um, mercy and a great tenderness and concern for our well-being. And we need people to serve and we need people to rise up and to love and to give and to care for each other in order for us as a family to continue to grow and mature and to honor you. So I pray that you would open these doors up, Father, for working in the hearts of other people to rise up. And I thank you for these, again, for our, our brothers and sisters and for your blessing upon them. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.